where I've I've actually talked to some people like they went to the unit out of SF because they were they knew it was a safer place. Like to me, it was about just getting more gunfights. Other people went because they're like, okay, I, I see how how trained this team is, but if you go to the next level up, it's right. going to be right. Everyone, you're going to be fighting level. with that. Right, that caliber. That caliber, it's gonna, it's gonna make you safer. Yeah, kind so, of. Like, you, as, as no, you that, was never, that was never the case for me. I didn't give a f- who I was fighting with. I just <laughs> right. wanted to get in more yeah. gunfights. No comment. <laughs> oh, he didn't kill Bin Laden. Probably blame me for being an idiot, but and which you were, which we all were. <laughs> you have to make it to where crime doesn't pay. You have to deter crime, whether it's crime or terrorism. It's the same principle. You have to clash with supervision. You have to, or nothing will get done. Supervisors can't learn how to supervise, and you can't learn how to respect a supervisor without confrontation. It has to happen. <laughs> Do not take that out. JV team for life. Have you ever been in your truck and you're like, you're looking around for a spitter, and you're like, you see a coffee mug, and you're like. Dude, my doula, I just spit on the <laughs> floorboard. Really? Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even have rubber floor mats. <laughs> smells I minty mean, no, in sure. here. I mean, yes, I have been that, and I'm like, fuck it. I mean, like, yeah, how did you get this? <laughs> I've, ha- I've had that. I mean, the doula is just a straight-up range truck now. So I just drive it at the range, end of the range. I'm like, fuck it. I uh, now. You ready? Now I'm ready. Let's All do right. this. Welcome back to the Anti-Hero Podcast, part Delta Force, part Street Cop, all podcasts. I'm your host, Tyler, owner of Refracted Wolf Apparel. Use promo code Anti-Hero for 15% off all the best graphic tees. It's all American outsider apparel. And I'm Brent Tucker, owner of First Responder Coffee and Cigar Company. Use FRCC15 to get 15% off everything in the store. And this episode is brought to you by Zero Nine Holsters, right? So an Ohio-based custom DD gear manufacturing company to include gun holsters, portable radio cases, and canine equipment. That's the official, but I just get DMs all the time saying I buy from them. Like, everybody buys from them. They're street cop owned. Good. They should. Uh, They test their own shit. So if you could head over there, they support us. Uh, We're a partner with them. They're, They're not a sponsor of the show. So they support our message. They believe in what we talk about. Um, so they gave us a promo code for any of our listeners. It's Antihero Z910. So Antihero, I said last episode, I said Zulu9. It's Z9. Antihero Z910. And you get 10% off your order. And today's episode is awesome because in we have two of the baddest dudes that ever walked the planet in this room. And we also have Brent. <laughs> I was gonna say. Nice. One. <laughs> oh, Bob, you're too humble. You know, you're you're a badass too. Um, that's what I was gonna mean. No, no, no. Oh man, this this is Rob O'Neill hasn't shown up yet. Oh gosh, and it and it continues. <laughs> the uh, this is gonna be one of my favorite episodes. Not that I I haven't enjoyed uh, past guests, but it's uh, it's not. Um, it's not every day you get to have your friend on as, as, a, as a guest. Um, I've known Bob for a long time. Here to my right is Bob Keller, former Ranger Bat, uh, former Green Beret, former Delta Force operator. Um, 24 years. I, say that, I, I sure, I sure as hell can say that. I say it all the time. Um, I don't, I don't care. I don't care what the former unit members, some of them say yeah. you can absolutely yeah, we say can, it we can definitely on, talk about that later uh oh yeah yeah we can uh 24 years in seems like you always beat me in everything you did a little bit longer than i did <laughs> not as a competition but it's always a competition uh, and you're also the owner of uh gambit resolutions and rangeworks rangeworks w-e-r-x yep so seems like uh you same old same old for you St- staying busy no no retirement for you no uh, continuing on, we'll, and we'll, you know, love to talk to you about that. I, I feel like, you know, operators retire and they only do like one or two things: they retire and go out in the mountains and just detach and don't want to talk to anyone ever, or they start a business and continue to get busier than ever. Yep. And uh, I, I see which one you picked, because um, there is no picking both. It's 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 one or the other. Because as as everyone at this table knows, once you go small business, it's you, work. It, it's work. It's yeah. nothing but work. Um, so with that being said, Bob, thanks for coming. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. One, one question. I've always wondered this. Why do guys that shed the same blood and the same mud through like 
the worst times and grow such bonds. How are y'all able to go have a nice life and never talk to each other again until like 10 <laughs> years later? Weird? I just, I just it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Not only can we do that, Bob was the last time I saw you. Can, can you even, uh, it probably was at the unit in the hallway. It's yes. just my best guess. Yeah, and which, really which, seen, which, yeah. which, I mean, which would have been, been six years ago, maybe? I mean, just. Well, Time that, flies. Just, I mean, I that's just passing. That's all. just that's just passing. I'm the last. Sorry, last I'm, I'm so saw you. you <laughs> last time, I mean, because once you go to different squadrons, yeah, uh, you, you, you I'm, I'm asked that all the time on squadrons. Like, oh, do you know so and so from C squadron or you right. know, B squadron? Fuck, I, you, if you don't actually work with them, right? I was, I was, you know, we, I don't we know, were half the guys that were across the hall on other troops. You know? Yeah, we, exactly. We were both, in, you know, individually in the and during. Uh, you were there just a few more, a, f a few years before me. Yeah. Um, but together, you know, we were there a decade, and overlapping that has to be at least six, seven years. Yeah. I'm trying to think of of ever. I mean, I know I saw you, but of, of ever actually even stopping and talking to you. No. And we went there together. Weird, and and right? if we did see each other three or four times in that in that whole yep. span, it's. The, it's life gets crazy uh, over there. You're just gone all the time, and you get put in your own little world. And but like uh, his question, great question. Like, how can you well, be that tight? And so, well, I mean, the guys that I were actually on a team with. I mean, that's really tight. You know, I mean, Brent and I were tight. We're in SF days, and then you, you never are not friends, but you just you right. don't talk to people. Well, it's like I think it's like the type A personality. Like when you're done, you're done. Like, we don't need we don't need to have that heartfelt right and warm well, moment of, of staying in touch like right there's, there's guys that i that were that i was on a team with that i still have not talked to since i've been retired and what and what i was i was long-windedly getting to was so we barely even saw each other at the unit i see you today for the first time and we and we can pick up like right. like like yep. you know like like we, <laughs> like we don't skip a beat it's awesome uh you know i know you could call even though we barely talk but i know if, if bob calls me i was like oh so bob needs something and I drive two hours a day if if you needed me there, you know, to cover down on a class for you yeah. or something. So, it is that weird thing where you don't talk like best friends, but you'll do anything for that guy uh, the, the moment it, he asks. It's, I mean, it's kind of cool having you being at the unit because I'm I always talk about stuff like this to people that ask, but they don't really know what the hell I'm talking about. <clears throat> Just like you were saying, like it's kind of that's what I, at least it might have might have been different for uh, for you and your squadron, but like, where I was at. Like, it's kind of a weird concept, and that might be that whole type A personality thing, but, like, everyone will eat their own. 100% at the, at in our the squadron. Troop, at the squadron, 100%. at the team. But when you're on target, so, I mean, like, you're not, like, best friends, even though you're tight, you know, when you're back in the States, but you might not like someone, you might not do anything with them, you're not, they right. might, they, they would call you out in a, in a heartbeat, but now when you're on target with them, though, right. everyone will die for each other. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, like, it's just a cool... <laughs> They definitely didn't necessarily pick guys, you know, who who would get along the best because we didn't. I think it necessarily that makes sense. The, the type A personality. The type A personality. I because everyone this wants way. to be the best. So if there's someone, <laughs> if there's someone a little bit better, you're like, well, fuck that guy. I talk to guys on my special forces dive team on on one five more than I do old teammates at the at the unit. Yeah. It's not that I don't talk to any of them, doesn't, but doesn't I, surprise I, I talk to my SF you know, old teammates, ODA teammates, more than I talk to the, uh, the unit guys. But oddly enough, again, I wouldn't call them any better or better friends or, you know, or less friends if they, if, you know, if, if they call me today. I'd drive to North Carolina tonight to, to handle whatever it is they need help with. So it's definitely... Yep, I agree. It's, it's, a, it's a weird. It's, it's a weird place to work, to be honest with you. It, uh, and it's also... Make no mistake about it, the best place to work. I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't. I'd do it all over again. Would you do it all over again? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I thought you were. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would go there. Heartbeat. It is 100% the best no. place. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. That was what I was saying. All right. Yeah. Well, Bob's got totally, a story to tell. Totally opposite <laughs> of that. Yes. No. I would absolutely do the same same route. Uh, yeah. I would never take that away. No, uh, from right. what I've talked, what I've heard. So, how long have you been out now? Oh, th three, four years. Three years. Three years. Yeah, yep. I'm, I've, I've been talking to people that have been getting out lately. Though it's it is 
changed in oh, the it, last three or four that years. Started, that started to happen as, as I was leaving. Just a drastic train, change in culture, yeah. a drastic change in the type of – and it's really no fault of their own. When we went to the unit, we had – Half a dozen rotations un, under our belt, and 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 real world good experience going there. You know, we had guys, we had guys showing up at the unit without a combat patch. You know, on on teams. Like when and you were leaving. When I was leaving, and yeah. uh, you know, and unfortunately, I think the problem is they kind of maintained the prior generation swagger of we you know we have all this combat experience, we've been there, you know, we got this, but. But they, but they don't. You yeah. know, they, they don't have that experience to rely on. But they, but they continued that swagger, and I think that's dangerous. Well, can you know, I ask a question? When you say combat on teams, did they didn't have any uh, special operations combat or just zero? zero it, no combat patch. So they, there was, you know, they definitely didn't have, uh, you know, conventional forces, or they didn't have their SF uh, combat patch or, or or ranger scroll combat patch. They. We got guys in the in the unit. With it's going to be different. Experience. I mean, I feel bad. But of course, for those it's going to happen. We're I not going to be in war forever, right? I mean, I feel bad for them. That's look, right. Look at how lucky we got. Oh. To hit it, hit it at the right moment to get. Man, did we like, get lucky. twelve years of fighting? That's never going to happen in the history no. of, in the, of America. Ever. I know that sounds weird for some people because you know, and when you say it like that, I'm like, yeah, we got lucky. And you some people, and some people are like, that's man, never going to happen again. To have the opportunity to mm -hmm. deploy we, 12 years in a row, we got to play <laughs> in, in the special operations realm, uh, and not just like practice for the game. We got we got to practice for the game, and then we got to play in the game on Sunday, right. and then we got to practice, and we got to play in the game next Sunday, and mm -hmm. we did that over and over and over again. And the American military, without a doubt, was the absolute best fighting force because of it. No one else in the world had seen that much experience in combat, and we'd learned a lot, and our tactics evolved immensely. And and the type of tactics, I mean, how long? I mean, I won't get into details, but. It took us years and years to evolve our tactics. So it's not like you just deploy once and you're like, well, that didn't work. We're, we're going to change the way we do business. It, you know, even even at the highest levels, you would think, you know, we immediately change the way we do business and continue to do the, the latest and greatest tactics. But even there, it takes a long time to to evolve tactics to, to meet the, the current threat. Yeah, yep. and, and even, even anybody in the military, like I talked to guys, and I've said that, like I got, I got, awarded the opportunity to deploy to Iraq. There's guys, and it just sounds weird because there's guys that joined during wartime, joined as an infantry guy and just got fucked. And like, you know, like Marines that had to do like sick infantry Marines that have to go two years security forces first. And then they missed like the oh. prime of the war. It's my and nightmare. Yep. So I've, I've run into a lot of those guys and they're pissed. Well, but at the end of the day, I, I don't have pity on, on any of those guys that told the old, oh, woulda, coulda, I joined to do this, and I didn't get to do it. Um, I wasn't as fortunate as Bob. I didn't join the Ranger Battalion, and if I could redo my career, that's one thing I would redo. I would join as a Ranger. Um, I say that, another part of me says I wouldn't change anything because you know, that was my path, and I, I, you know, we ended up at the same spot, so it worked out for me. But I joined National Guard Air Defense. The furthest thing from a combat that's, unit. That's Pogue with a capital P O G. Oh right. <laughs> well, it's and, funny. I don't know if anyone knew that. I, like I, when I got out of Range Battalion, went to college, I joined the ADA. Get out of here. Yeah. I didn't know in that. Daytona. No, and it was in Sarasota or Bradenton. Okay. It was like a small little ADA oh, unit. Like I went I, to my recruiter. I'm know, like, I don't know. We were fellow air defense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did I did I not you know, know what I was getting into? Holy you, shit! You've ruined you've ruined my whole pitch <laughs> I, because I I don't think I've ever said this, but I've but I've always felt it. Let's say was I there first though? I don't. I always was there. <laughs> I have to be the only guy ever nope. from air defense to go nope. to the Delta Force. This whole time nope. I've known another guy that technically wasn't it. Did you go to the school or did yeah? You just, Oh, did the you Avenger really? and the Stinger so 14 was, Sierra? Whatever. I have no idea what it was. But it was up at it was up at Camp Blanding and That's, I went through the whole thing. Oh my gosh. That's but it was kind crazy. of funny because I got out of Ranger Battalion and I found out I didn't because I was just going to school, right? I'm gonna get my fourth degree. I was gonna, my plan was to go to, to be Secret oh, Service. You you had to be the only Ranger. My bad. That's no, all right. Is Yeah, I was funny. So you know, you know I try to tell the story and people just don't get it. You've been there, you know mm -hmm. how like how the people are there oh yeah so kind of funny 
try to try to make it quick. So I, I get out of range of battalion. I go to the recruiter. I'm like, hey, I, I found out if you go to if you if you're in the National Guard in Florida, Florida they pay 100 percent of your tuition, right? Well, and I had the GI Bill going. I'm like, well, well, oh, shit. I, like, I don't have to pay any of the tuition. I don't, I'm like, yeah. it's gonna be free. So I go on the recruiter. I'm like, hey, what's the closest closest National Guard unit to this school? Right, and they're like, oh, and pulls up the thing. Well, we got an ADA. I, I didn't even know what ADA was. Had no clue. <laughs> what I year said, was this? I, I was like, I'll take it. Yeah, what year? Because all I had to do uh, had been two thousand. Two thousand. Okay. Okay, so you were in the Rangers. Yeah. Before yep. GWAT. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I got out and went, and, and I was like, I'll take it. I had no clue what the unit was. I didn't care because I just I was just going to college. I knew right. all, all I had to do is one week in a month. Right? <laughs> college is free. Yeah. So I show up. Which is funny because you probably you've you've seen it. Um, the first drill that I go to just happened to be their PT test, and when I just got on range of time, I'm I'm still oh, pretty yeah. studly. I'm you know right. good with my PT test. I'm clearing everything. I mean, oh. 300 right. plus, right? And I'm sure it's an emotional event for some of those boys. Oh yeah, so I get in there and they have to be you kind of have to be separated. They only allow like five people in the room, so everyone else can't watch, oh, you know, because they probably yeah. don't want people to be embarrassed. So right. I get in yeah. there. Everybody turn around. I, you know, it, it right. was like turn around yeah. thing. And it was push-ups first, so they're, they're doing push-ups. And I'm coming out of range battalion. If you don't max out, you're getting smoked, right? I mean, you're getting yelled at. So I'm just, that's what I was used to because I hadn't been to any other military unit. So they start doing push-ups, and I swear to God, like, dudes are doing, like, five push-ups. And I'm like, oh, man, these guys are going to get smoked. They're going to get in trouble. All I hear is, come on, man, you can do one more of them. <laughs> <laughs> like no one's in trouble. Oh, culture They're shock. actually giving them like encouragement to do one more to make it to six. You know. Well, wow. I. I hope that allows you to think even more highly of me because that was the culture I was brought up in. That's crazy. To, <laughs> to, to, to get where mm -hmm. I had to go. Um, Which actually we, is really impressive for you to go uh, to that and be like, all right, there's something else. What can, <laughs> what can, I, what can is, I go do this now? This is not Black Hawk Down. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so we, we, because it's hard not to, because uh, we haven't seen each other in so long. We, ju we jumped right. We jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to talk um, a little bit about what uh what brought you uh to your first you know enlistment and, and how you were lucky enough or fortunate enough to go right to the rangers and then yep. what made you get out and, and i'm assuming which is one contract yeah 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 so uh out of high school i had like scholarship offers to go play golf or play hockey i picked golf because young 18 year old kid i'm thinking i'm just gonna go play golf and make a million bucks like i thought it would be that easy right so i went, went down to florida Spent however many years down there uh, before turning pro. So I played professional golf down there. I was doing like the mini tours and eventually started doing the Hooters tour. Um, and that was actually traveling around. So actually being, up, being on the road, going tournament, tournament. I think I did that for like two seasons. And, it and was, how old are you at this time? So I was 23 okay. going into 24 because I didn't go in the military until I was 24. So like the second second season out on out on tour or out on the road. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was either Louisiana or Mississippi um playing a tournament missed the cut so it's a thursday friday that's when you see if you make the cut to play saturday sunday and then you're in the money um so thursday friday i missed the cut and i'm like this is after playing professionally a couple of years and I, I go back to my hotel room and i'm like you can either go to the next next tournament and start practicing or you can just stay in that same town and just start drinking right <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like sitting in my hotel room and i'm like what the fuck am i doing like it finally just dawned on me i'm like i am not playing golf because i like it I'm playing golf because I want to make money at it. Right. Like it wasn't a passion of mine. Yeah. yeah. Right. So right, like kind of light bulb moment. I was like, fuck it. If I'm if I'm doing this just for the money and I'm not making money, right. I'm probably doing the wrong thing, right? Yeah. I literally packed up, <laughs> drove back down to Florida, and like two days later, I was fucking enlisted. You know what's crazy? So that's that's what got me in the military. <laughs> me and Brent were just talking to our last guest about, you know, it's when a door shuts right in front of your face. Like, I mean, to put it bluntly, you weren't the best golfer in the world. And then you couldn't make it as a career, and you turn around and you do some of the most prestigious stuff in the military you could possibly do. Right. So. And if it wasn't for, mm -hmm. well, as I'll put it, if it wasn't for God shutting that shutting that door on you, and uh, you know, you, 
to put it like we said last episode, people get upset and like, man, I really wish, you know, there would be some sort of direction in my life. Or if you're religious like I am, I wish God would, please God, show me the way. And then when God shuts a door, you're like, man, life sucks. You know, you're like, well, th- you want a definitive answer to, to your problem and God gives you one. And here you are looking a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> like your, your problem in, in one essence wasn't, you know, that cut and dry. It wasn't like it just, you know. Like you didn't make selection, so that that door is shut. So the door is still open for you, but it was a fairly easy answer because just like you said, you didn't enjoy it. You're here to make money. You're not making money, so change. You know, which is funny. Yeah, I mean, how many people in this, how many people in their whole lifetime actually get to do something that they love, right? Well, I, I didn't. I was never a military. My my grandpa was in the military. My dad was in Vietnam. My grandpa was in World War II. I mean, kind of came from a military family, but it was never pushed on me. Yeah, that was never a fucking thing. Right. But as a kid, that's all I like to do is like to shoot guns and freaking camp out in the woods by myself, right? So I was in me, right. but I just didn't yeah. think, well, how am I going to make money? I, like I wasn't pushed to go in the military. So, but by missing that cut was like yeah. the best thing that ever right. happened. Made me go in the military, and even then, after Ranger Battalion, my thing was I, I got to get college. I got to go yeah. do my four year degree. And it was like being at the Ranger Battalion, you get there, you start doing the stuff kind of like uh, what we were talking about earlier. You, you train on it. You want to do it. Well, obviously I wanted to deploy. I wanted to get a deployment or go to, I wanted to go to war with, with Ranger Battalion. Well, nothing was going on. <laughs> so I'm like, Military life little, little is did not you for know. me. Like, I'm <laughs> not a military you know. guy. I don't yeah. like wearing uniforms. I don't like saying yes or no, sir. <laughs> yeah. So right. I was like, I'm out. Yeah. You know, I don't like it to go I, li- I like to do the stuff that we did there, but yeah. nothing was going on. So I got out, went right. to college, and then while I was at college, sure enough, 9-11 kicked off and got hooked up with someone at uh, 20th Special Forces Group. And they're like, well, shit, you're in the, you're in the Guard. Why don't you just go to selection? You, you know, you'll have a chance to deploy. And then, and you, like, do you remember who you got hooked up with in, in 20th Group? Remember who uh, you met? Kinkle. Was it was yeah. Kinkle the first somehow guy you met? Got, yeah, somehow someone told me about him, or he found me, and I was like, "Yep, I'll go," because that was my chance to possibly deploy. But I still didn't. I was like, "I don't like the military." Not that I don't like the military. I'm just not a military guy, right? Yeah. But that was like a chance to go, and sure enough, we had that that uh, well, the first deployment I went on. So this is circa it's like, like 2002. Is that yeah, if you had yep. to guess? Because, but it's cool. Like, not many people get to find their passion, right? Like, and I wouldn't have known this was like gunfighting was my passion. First gunfight or first time I got shot at, I knew right there, this is, this is my fucking life. So like, I mean, it wasn't like, oh shit, we're getting shot at. Right, like, holy right. fuck, I won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So let's, let's rewind real quick to 20, 20 Special Forces group. Cause that's, that's where, that's where our friendship started. Mm-hmm. That's where I met you as an NQP, which yep. I, I'm sure they call the program something different now, but a non-qualified personnel. <laughs> Was I like running the NQP or not running? No, like, you, uh, the, you and I were in there. together? Yeah, we were okay. in there together. Yeah. All right. So my first exposure, no one, one of my first, <clears throat> one of my first drills, is yeah, I meet Bob, and uh, and I'm, I'm sure I remember Bob more than Bob remembers me because I'm I'm a big, I'm a I'm a lowly air defender. Little man, I <laughs> it's wish that because of that. I have no memory. <laughs> I'm a lowly air defender, and now I'm in this world that I wanted to be in. This you know the beginning of this special operations world. And I have a former Ranger back guy that's that's here with us, and we had a former SEAL that was with us, mm-hmm. Derek Ray, mm-hmm. and uh, and both you guys physically, you know, w- was what I expected, and what I needed, because I remember the first, I think it was four, even just just a four mile ruck we did, I met the standard, but I don't think I saw you since the first five minutes of of of, of the starting point. So I'd say you can see the difference of just doing the standard or that's right. And, and what, and yeah, this is one of the things that I really, and I'll, I'll talk more about this. Um, but that was the beginning of you showing me the standard of what it, of, of what it takes. And you didn't even know it at the time, but that from that beginning, I was, I was chasing you both figuratively and literally in a ruck march, you know, <laughs> and I'd come up like, Hey, what, you know, what's good to have what, that. Drive, it's great. Though. It's great. Hey, what Bob do it in? And I don't remember what you did. And I'm going to make up a number, you know, f- you know, 42 minutes, you know? Uh, and, uh, and I came in, like, I think that's a standard was, was an, an hour for a four mile. Right, a 15 and, minute mile pace. Yeah. Like and so I, I probably came in like 58 minutes and, and to me, I was like, He's he's running these things in the forties. I got I got work to do if I want to if I want to be at you know at 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 this level. Yeah, and uh, so that's that's there's more there's more stories like that, Bob. But that's the beginning. 
I don't think I'd have made it to the Delta Force if it wasn't for being an NQP. I, let's back up. I wouldn't have made it in Special Forces, I don't believe, if I didn't start that NQP with, program with you and you showing me, as cheesy as it sounds, what a stud looks like, what the standard is, yeah, what it takes. To go past the what, standard. Yeah. yeah. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a... Uh, and weird because you know, I was a type A personality back then. I just hadn't had the experience to prove it. Um, right. Like it was to everyone else in the NQP program. It was basically like, hey, when's Bob going to selection? Because he's going to make it. When Bob's going to the Q course, he's going to get his green beret. You know what I mean? And and the rest of us were just worried about it. And, that, and that's just <laughs> the truth. That is the truth. And so uh, it was it was it was very cool to start, you know, that uh, yeah. that, that chase unit. And, and, and it happened then. Well, that's fucking badass because that got you to the unit. You know it, I mean? it, 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 it eventually did. We go to, the, I don't, I saw you a couple times, I, th I think, you know, in, in the Q course, but you were, you were just a couple classes ahead of me, a class or two. Well, and I was an 18 uh, Echo, which was a little bit longer course. Yeah. We were definitely there at the same time, but I don't really remember uh, seeing you a whole lot, um, yeah, if, if right. ever, at, at the Q course. Um, you graduate the Q, the Q course. Uh, before we get in the South America trip, we did between you graduating the Q course and the, and the South America trip. What what'd you do? What do you mean? If you can remember, what'd you do for work? What'd you do? Did you go to a school? <coughs> but after the Q course, after so, the Q so course, you green got your beret green beret. Yeah. Uh, I was doing the Kadota. Yeah, tell the them about, counter counter drug stuff. Tell them a little bit about about Kadota, and I think that's one of the best kept secrets in in, in the I'm, program. I tell people that all the time. I don't know if it still exists, but holy, they crap. Took, especially for cops. They took the, like, they quit calling it Kadota. Because for the ODA part, because they basically gutted it with SF guys because they're okay. not reliable because they deploy too much or they go to too many gotcha. schools and they replaced it with a bunch of conventional yeah. guys. I thought it was a and watered down the program. Boo. It was, an, it was yeah. a conventional guy. Yeah. It was an unbelievable oh. job. And, and like you said, uh, so Kadota counter drug ODA. Yeah. 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 Kind of like a, uh, I wouldn't say it's, we didn't, we definitely didn't try to keep it a secret because we, no. we were pushing out. To, <laughs> right. So as long as, as long as it somehow pertained to drugs, uh, FBI could use us and it had to be in Florida. It was, uh, all, any cops could use us. Uh, I mean, agencies or cops that were in Florida and it pertained to drugs. They could just, it was like a simple one page paperwork to basically hire us. And it was like if you want, if you wanted, right? if you were doing a, a big, big case on a big drug or a marijuana growth or something, but you didn't want to sit on it. Well, you get the Kodota. We'll go sit on that thing for two weeks, get all the video, all the frick, okay. yeah, like record on everything for two weeks. So we're sitting in the summer in, you know, ghillie suits, getting eaten by mosquitoes. It sucks. That would suck for you to do that. That's what we would do. And then when you when it came time to go do the bus, we'd give you the packet basically, and you guys would go do go do the hit. Okay. So, so because you're military, like it was awesome. We could law enforcement if they knew about it. We could only do reconnaissance. We couldn't mm -hmm. we couldn't do anything offensive. Yeah. Because that would that would go past our 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 were you guys allowed rules to, and limitations. Yes, we were allowed to weapons on yep. you in case you know, self defense. At least when when I was there, yeah, you, yeah, could, you could have was, your was always you could have your, uh, your carbine in. You could have yeah. a pistol on you. I. Uh, I I, I tackled a guy running from the objective once, and and I got to talking to about that because it, <laughs> because it, it kind of it breaks our our rules, and it kind of it's like we're going offensive. But I couldn't just watch him outrun the cop and get away, especially after sitting on it in the in the in, <laughs> exactly. In the You're woods. not losing this for me, man. <laughs> That's right. In the <laughs> woods, getting eaten by bugs for a week, and then to see this guy outpacing the cops you know and he's kind of you know he's kind of heading my way like i know i can i can get him like nah i'm gonna go get him well that wasn't and the one we was, were in the ghillie suits in the woods was it on the back side of a fence no 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 because that, uh, that happened to us on one one of the not missions but i guess, <laughs> like mission. when I guess it's a mission when, when we're yeah. sitting there same thing um, kind of happened. Yeah, uh, I think maybe I told the story before uh i was i was sitting with uh one of the guys we were watching this this meth house this this meth head would would come out of his his trailer like at two o'clock in the morning and just circle it a couple times, go back in. This was one of the, the first reconnaissance missions I did. Come back out at three a.m., circle the house, look everywhere, go back in. I mean, what's he doing? And uh, the guy next to me goes like, "Yeah, they they, they just get really um, they get really paranoid, you know, when uh, mm -hmm. these meth heads do, and they think someone's someone's you know they they think someone's looking at them and surveilling them." Yep. And I was like, "But we." We are. <laughs> he's, he's like, dead he's, on. Yeah, he's right. He's right. He's like, yeah, but he doesn't know that. And I was like, well, if we do our job right, he won't. But he is right. It is a little. It is a little. I. A little ironic.
So you did. So you did that, which I I didn't do when I first came out of the Q course. But as any good guard bum, I eventually uh, went, went went there. In fact, we were there at the same time uh, for I, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I believe your wife cut my hair. Yep. Uh, on yep, on occasion, that's, that's, she'd that's come where in. Katie and I met. Yeah, yeah. So you go do Kadota. I'm still getting out of. The, I just got out of the Q course, and the first thing I do. Is I link up with your team because you guys need a combo guy because I don't know why you had no combo guy, and you thought, hey, let's bring this guy fresh out of the Q course to, to go to South America and rely on for all of our combo, but it scared the crap out of me. Well, now wasn't Brent there? So you were a junior combo guy, or did you go as a senior? I, I was. Maybe? I was the only okay. combo guy on the team. Right. He he must not have been able to make. Who who would have been your combo guy at the time? <laughs> I can't remember his last name, but Brent. Pimienta? Is it Brent? Yeah, Pimienta? I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess he couldn't make the trip, and so that's why that's why I came on the trip, and uh, we go down to South America together. Yep. And I just remember it being the longest C one thirty flight I feel like I've ever been on. It was just it just feel like it, like like it like the headwind made it go like twenty miles an hour. It just felt like that trip took forever. Yeah, and did we eventually take a civilian flight out of there though? We took it so we so we get there, we land in a in a random dirt field oh, airstrip yes, yes like kind of yes. in the middle of the night they were, was, we were past we were we weren't supposed to land we weren't supposed to land so they basically they got us out and the the freaking bird started taking off like as our cargo is coming off <laughs> that's right just so they could get the hell out of there without getting stuck there it was so hectic See, and it I, felt, I had totally forgot it, about that and too. It felt, <laughs> and, and, and in a weird way of course like in hindsight it was one of the safest things we, we'd ever do in our career overseas but it, it it felt like a Green Beret mission, yeah, like landing yeah. on this yep, dirt yep. airstrip. That AC one third like yeah, we got to get out of here, we got to get out of here. Like unload everything, unload everything. And I remember Brian because he had just got back from Afghanistan. The the team did not too long ago, and he goes out and he pulls a knee and starts pulling security, <laughs> and uh, and Chief, um, I'm forgetting names, Chief, um, don't ask me. You the the warrant officer on on the team. Um, I'm gonna think. I'll think of his name here in a second. Well, because he, he was a great dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, he comes and goes. Hey, Brian, we're we're not in combat. Don't you no no reason to pull armed security in here. <laughs> like we we landed in you know on in, in safe territory, and uh, anyway, we, for the next couple of weeks, we're we're training the condors, yeah. Yeah. and um, and that was awesome. We got to shoot tens of thousands of rounds pretty much unsupervised wear a baseball hat for the first time like as a, as a e5 fresh green beret uh it chief jensen jensen yeah it was a great experience for me um our medic at the time uh well i'll say alex yep he ends up at the unit with us as yep. as a medic so you have three guys on that trip that end up uh, at the delta force and i tell this story weird right it is weird i mean that is that is unusual um <laughs> And I told this story before. I get really sick on a Friday night. It was like the, one of the first Friday nights we had to go out, and I was really excited about going partying with the boys. I get I get like bedridden sick. It was like a twenty four hour flu. Alex is giving me an IV, and um, or giving me a shot, and as he's getting it, the needle ready, he drops the needle and can't find it, and and like and the like the the folds of my covers. You guys are outside honking the horn. Let's go, Alex. Let's go, Alex. <laughs> To go party. I'm dying here. And I was like, ah, screw it. Grabs another needle, sticks it, and goes, hey, just don't roll over a whole lot. I can't find that needle. I got to go. <laughs> and I sat there in that bed, scared to move, knowing there is a needle somewhere in this yeah, bed that funny. he... <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> that he could find because he didn't want to miss his ride to town to go party with the guys. There's there's a story that uh, you you probably forgot about. Uh, I don't know if I ever heard we, that one. We cause, probably because he probably he wouldn't have wanted to say he, that. He wouldn't have wanted to told that story. And as a new guy on the team, I probably wouldn't have wanted to uh, to, to call him out over it. You know, I was probably too scared to call him out. Yeah. So um, we get through there, um, and this is this is another uh, just honestly puts you up on a uh, in a pedestal uh, story we'll get to dive school you'll probably have a different you know, take on dive school as i did because i'll tell you how i remember you in dive school <laughs> and you can go ahead and tell people you can tell people how you remember being me in dive school we were training up for dive school before we went on this before we went on this trip yes. we were going out to the pool uh training you doing going weight belt swim kingston, kingston lake or? yeah we you'd uh, i'd go to the the pool like in Jacksonville, Josh Betton would take me, you know, and 
and Rick Spear would take me. I remember the first time um, Rick a- asked me to do a weight belt swim. He basically just gives me 16 pounds, gives me fins and a mask. He goes, hey, this is what you're going to do. I need you to swim in circles for, do you remember the time? Ten, eight minutes, 10 minutes, <laughs> whatever the time is. I th- want to say it's 10 minutes. I am like two minutes into this thing and about to drown. And I decide like, well, I have to go to the side of the pool and I don't even know if I'm going to make it to the side of the pool. I grab the side of the pool. I'm completely out of breath. Rick gets down, leans over, looks at his watch and goes, that wasn't 10 minutes. <laughs> and that's when I knew I got a lot of work for die school. <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. a lot of work for die school. Yeah. We go down to South America I don't know if you remember this. For me, I was told you're not going to dive school anymore. Do you remember being told you're not going to dive school? Hmm. Okay. So, and it may have been did we're sending we one. Both get told that. I thought we both got told that the funding got they cut. Probably just told him that. They're <laughs> 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 probably like, "Hey, tell Bob." <laughs> I got told we, there is no funding for dive school, and you're not going to dive school. In fact, I know, I know you, you knew this because I'll tell you how we got to dive school and, and kind of how I found out. We're at a roadside cafe. Several weeks into this and into this trip, and I check my AKO online email account. We talk about <laughs> rolling back the past. Yeah, or, yep. uh, knowledge online. All me or knowledge yeah, online, yep. and I have an ATARS notification email. And so I get on the SAT phone and I call Jeremy Sinclair. I said, "Hey, Jeremy, I was told we weren't going, but I do. I did get this email from ATARS saying that you know I have a slot, and it's like two days from now." Am I going or am I not going? And he said, if you have an if you have an ATAR slot, you're absolutely going. I said, is Bob was supposed to go with me? Is Bob going? He goes, and he pulls it up, and he's like, yeah, you and Bob are definitely going to dive school. How the fuck do you remember this shit? <laughs> so, I, so I come back, and I tell Chief Jensen, hey, me and Bob got, got a slot to go to dive school. And that's when we started figuring out, okay, how are we going to get you guys back? Um, they're not slotted to leave anytime soon. And so they make a decision. We're gonna we're gonna put you guys on a civilian. We're at the, we're at the very southern part of Bolivia. The airport's yes. in the very north. Yep. And do you remember what's going on in the country at the time? Why that? <laughs> what what made that road trip a little sketchy? Well, I mean, I remember the road trip, but no, I don't remember what's going on. Well, I don't. Uh, I want to say it was an election. There's something that caused civil unrest, and there were roadblocks everywhere. Yes. And for two guys who didn't speak very good Spanish. We did have the only thing that saved us was a pocket full of pesos, and uh, I, I would say I probably that's cool as shit though. Hey, yeah, like trying cool to shit. trying to get to the airport, no, no interpreter with us. Uh, I I had just gotten out of the, the Q course, the you know the the um, and this the, is just so you could get to dive school. Yeah, this is not even like a. <laughs> so I spoke Spanish the best because I just got out of Spanish school. You know, probably six months before this. And when I say it, it's like Inglorious Bastards, yeah, like yeah. I said, third best. Like you don't want me as your interpreter. You say Ola, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we would hit these checkpoints, and we'd just like pull out this cash and be like, "How much this do you yeah, need?" I do remember. And I do someone remember would just that. like take it, take some money, give us the rest of the money back, you yep. know. And uh, we paid our way through checkpoint after checkpoint. We we make it to the airport, and then we have our next uh, problem. Uh, which is we our passports were not stamped in because we landed on a dirt right. strip. Do you yep. me- do you remember the debacle at the airport? How we got out? Nope. I love this. I, I'm telling you this story. <laughs> I fucking love it too because yeah. I totally forgot about this story. <laughs> Chief Jensen gives us a, a phone number to the embassy. He says, "You have any problems? Call the embassy." So me and you were standing there at the uh, at this counter, and the guy spoke English, bad English. We spoke it. And he goes, how'd you, and he's like, how'd you get in this country? And we're like, we landed on a dirt strip. We just told him the truth. And he was like, well, you're not getting out anytime. You're not getting out today. And we're about to close down this airport. And yeah. uh, that and, I remember. Yeah, we're not closed down this airport because of the civil unrest. Yep. And um, and I don't care. And, I, and we said, hey, call call this number. And he goes, I don't care who's on that number. At the end of the day, you got it. I don't know how you got into my country. And it's going to take us a while to fix this. So. And we're like, just call the number, please. We didn't even know who that number was. He's just a number at the embassy. He goes. He makes a phone call for about 30 seconds. He comes back on disgustedly. He goes, give me your passports. And he stamps us in. And then he stamps us out a couple seconds later. <laughs> and if, if you could find that passport, it'll have a stamp <laughs> of us cool. being in Bolivia for about 30 seconds. Pretty cool. <laughs> we fly 
dang near straight to die. You like, were we, probably like the smart one. I was like, Brent, just take it. I, don't, I have <laughs> no idea what the That's probably why I don't remember <laughs> it. <laughs> it was more, well, like, I remember I, getting out. Hey, I, I appreciate you considering me the smart guy, but you're probably like, hey, young buck. <laughs> no, and that call, would have been the case of. Call all. me if you have a problem, <laughs> and this will be a, you know, if uh, I'll, I'm, I'm here. I'm here if you need me. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we go to dive school. We only had a couple days be- between dive school. I think I went home packed and went yeah. right to dive school. Yeah. Met you there. I'll I feel like I've been, you're the guest. I feel, like, I feel like I've been talking a while. I don't remember you having a problem at dive school. No. Academically was w- would have been like your, <laughs> your, your problem, but that wasn't my problem. I just didn't care, <laughs> but come on, Brent. But, I would have much rather had that been my problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the problem I've, I've I always been just the knucklehead, you know, knuckle dragger, not the smartest guy. What is it? If you're going to be dumb, then you got to be tough. You're just right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, so I'll tell you, this is, this is a second. And now. Yeah. Scuba now school is actually really fun we're, for me. We're green. Bra- yeah. I'm, I bet it was. I remember it being fun for you. We were roommates. We were roommates in, in dive school. I remember you. I don't know if you remember. You probably remember this when I. Uh, do you, what do you remember about me being your roommate? Because you complained about it all the time. What happened? You had to go do the like remedial stuff, oh, right? Yeah, I did have to do some remedial <laughs> stuff. When that one, then the story. You say that? Yeah, the okay, story. Okay, okay. You're like Brit. <laughs> <laughs> you kept me up all night. You snore unbelievable, and I'm like, yeah, because I'm I'm exhausted every day. I'm barely well, getting out of the it's pool. It's actually, you know, guys like. Like like you that had to go to remedial. I mean that's you're ten times tougher than me because they had to go to remedial in the like afternoon, so they're getting more PT. And then they had to go, they so they got less sleep or less less relaxed time. Right. Remedial in the pool. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. dude. Yeah. So then uh, they're coming back. Even, even the, no, they have like no break. I'm back there. That's not studying. That's probably why I failed tests. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad. It really that, was like impressive. I, I'm I'm glad that I didn't remember it wrongly, and that you were like, "Oh no, I, I was sucking." Because the way I remember, because yeah, you know, you know t- t- time goes I, I on. I felt bad for you because oh, you, you come back after doing another half hour, an hour or meal, maybe two hours. I don't know what it, what they did, to you guys. I oh, I remember. I just remember you. Th- but then you have to wake up and do the regular. Yeah. That's day, that's, the next day, and like that's, I'm refreshed, right? I, you know, I had a that's time. Why you look so tired, Brent? Yeah, <laughs> that's how I remember Bob. I remember Bob not sweating in the pool, doing his weight built swim, and just getting it was out because right I was so fat. Getting yeah. out, doing some stretches, joking around a little bit, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm I'm barely can <laughs> pull myself out of the pool. It was an emotional event for me. And it was always the weight belt swim. Everything else was was okay. The runs, I always finished first in the runs. The weight belt swim was my nemesis. And I never um they they gave us a couple shots at it. I think it's seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven minutes is how long you have to do weight belt swim for. And they give you several, ch- you know, chances at it until you have to do it for real. And I don't think I did the seven minute weight belt swim until the day they're like, Brent, you need to do a seven belt, oh, yeah. seven minute weight belt I rem- swim. I remember that. Today. Yeah. <laughs> how, how much weight was it? 16 pounds. Is it that bad? I mean, to, to the listener that's never done that before, is it like if, me? Well, it's easy as shit. <laughs> <laughs> if you had my technique. <laughs> It's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Were you a good if, swimmer? If your name's, I'm a great swimmer. Yeah. I'm born and raised in Florida. I'm a great <laughs> swimmer. But being a good swimmer and being a good thinner are two uh, different okay. things. Um, we had a third 20th group guy in that in that course, Josh Betton. Do you, he was he was in that course with us. Josh Betton went to dive school with us. Really? Yep. Because he he ended up being my senior at Echo. And there's just another time. I'm just saying, 20th group representative. Oh, Josh. Group. Yes. 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 Yeah, he was at Kadota with us. Well. Yeah. yeah. Um, that yeah. yeah, 20th group had issues of sorts of guys getting, getting dive qualified. And now it just really kind of seemed like there was a new era in 20th group. You know, we, we got, we got some new guys here. They want to go to dive school. We send three guys to dive school, three guys come back with their dive bubble, uh, first try. Yeah. And that's almost, uh, unheard of, which looks good because then they're yeah. like, okay, we'll that's give right. you more spots. That's right. looks, it looks, it looks very good. So we go to uh, we go to dive school, um, which which what you call your six week vacation in <laughs> Key West. I call it the worst time of military career. <laughs> and I can I can see how that could be the worst thing ever. Um, we had we had some unique guys in our dive school. We had um, um, 
Sue LaRue, which was an Olympic swimmer. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why he didn't go to the Olympics is because we boycotted the 1984 Olympics because of Russia. Uh, don't yeah, don't quote me on that. That's really the, the year. It's, I think it's 84. It might be 88. It was close. He was our class leader. Uh, he's one of those. He's a legend in SF. One of the few guys, like you could almost ask anyone, but like, you know, a guy named Sue LaRue. And everyone's like, oh, I know Sue LaRue. I got it. And they have a Sue LaRue story. <laughs> um, and another guy, I think his name, that Sue had no problem in dive school. You had no problem in dive school. I remember one other guy just having. Now I know his name. No problem in dive school. He was at selection with us at the unit. Ed Holmeyer. Really? Do you remember Ed Holmeyer being in a dive school? Mm-mm. I do not remember these things. I don't know. Because I don't feel like I have a good memory. That's uh, I and... barely remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we're doing this podcast. This podcast is now the me reminding Bob what he did, what he did in his career That's podcast. So I love doing these things with other teammates because they'll like they'll talk about a mission. I'm like, oh my god, I never, I totally forgot about that. <clears throat> Usually, if you talk about it then i'll be then i'll remember but like just pulling stuff out of my head like people all the time be like hey what's your what's your most scariest mission or what's the best mission i'm like i can't uh, yeah like i just can't yeah, pull it up but if yeah. you if you told me right. about it then i'd be like i totally totally uh, remember that. what i'm trying to think after oh after dive school i go to afghanistan um because i like I, I wanted to go to combat wanted to go to combat so bad that i strap hang with 220 going overseas so i went from dive school straight to a PMT for train up straight to Afghanistan. I do six months in Afghanistan and you guys deploy to Iraq while I'm in Afghanistan. Yeah. And I like you, I, I, I get a taste of combat and I'm like, yeah, it in a weird way. You kind of only get two reactions to it. It's either like, Oh shit, you be careful what you wish for. And it scares the crap out of you yep, or, you, or you become addicted to it yes. like a drug. And, and I became addicted to it immediately. Yep, and it was same. everything I wanted it to be. And so when 320 um, deployed to Iraq, uh, they were like, hey, you don't have to go on that deployment. You're already on a deployment. I said, nope, I will see you boys there. I went home for two weeks, partied my ass off, and then met you guys in um, met you guys in Iraq. And the first mission we did, and I'm so glad I left when I did. I could have waited a little bit longer to go, but I was in a hurry to get there. Because the first mission we did I, was a company mission, and we staged out of Saddam's palace. Yes, that was a good one. That was yep. a good one. That was, it was a company one. Like, it was like uh, five tur- or six ODAs. Tur- 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 what? Tur- to crit. To crit, yeah. Yep. Five or six ODAs launching simultaneously on different targets from Saddam's palace. That was a cool one. And uh, again, it was a, a really good experience to be like, this is this is Greenberg stuff. I got a of me stuff. taking a dump in Saddam's toilet. <laughs> so right there, it's a bonus. Uh, I got a... I got a quick story for you uh, about that. I don't know if you remember the brief we got from Sergeant Major Baker, which was, hey, guys, uh, we're not here to loot. Don't take anything from this palace. Do you remember that brief by chance? I might have some, I might have some tile from that palace. So <laughs> uh, Sidney Abbott is, is – he's a character. Sid's a character. He's, I see him kind of – what looks to me is he's like sneaking out of like our, our sleeping area. And I go, Sid, what are you doing? He goes, nothing. I said, what are you doing? He goes, come with me. And so there was these massive banisters, like massive like stairwells going up the second level. And they have these gold, what looks like chest, pawn chest pieces that are like two or three foot tall that the banister is holding up the, the stair rail. And me and him go there. He's like, I want one of these. He goes, you can get one too. I said, I said, I, well, good. I want one too. And... <laughs> Uh, we remove two of them and he's like, hurry up. You know, it's like middle of the night. He's like, let's, let's get them out to the Humvees. <laughs> and we run them out to the Humvees and, and Sergeant Major Baker catches us. <laughs> and he goes, what was the one thing I told you guys Never not to do? Story. I said, uh, and yo, Sid, Sid, Sid can deescalate anything. He was like, Oh, Sergeant Major, these are just, these are just laying on the ground. And, uh, we were going to take them, you know, we were going to, it's our job to clean up the trash around here, right? And you know, and if it's just laying on the ground, it's trash. We're going to put them in the Humvee. We're going to throw them away when we get back to base. <laughs> it was such a ridiculous answer that Carl, who's a pretty straightforward guy, laughed and said, "Get out of here! Don't tell anyone else uh, about that." And so that was that. That was my first real entry into SF, looting Saddam's palace, 
company wide hit into daylight you know raids uh, into into there, and that was a wildly successful mission. Like the, the it was we were going after financiers and a whole network, and it had reached back all the way to Germany, and uh, Interpol ended up making arrests on intelligence that we brought off oh, off that mission. That was that was a it wasn't the sexy like I don't think anyone killed anyone that that day. Yeah, um, it was it was all financiers, but those those are the people who who make the war go. Yeah, you know the, the without money, uh, you know you, you're not doing anything. So the where, where were you? Where were you for that deployment? Uh, Kirkuk, Kirkuk. How what? How was how was that deployment for you? It was good. Yeah, I mean, well, you got uh, Mark, who's a go getter. I mean, it was like we never we never had downtime like other teams. Each team can do what they want, basically. Mm-hmm. I mean, you get you get stuff from higher, but I mean, you you can make work or you can not find work. You know, so we had a very motivated team. So we were we were busy all the time. I mean, it was it you guys was like, had a good team. Yeah, you guys had a real good team. Really good team, and you I the like I would team, never but... I would never take I'd never not go that route too because not many SF teams or SF dudes over there actually got to do the real SF mission. Like you know, everyone wants to do the sexy stuff, the DA stuff. I mean, the true SF mission is force multiplier. Go into a country, you know, train up the frickin' force and then let right. them do the hits. Right. And that's what we did. I mean, we got it on a couple times, which was which was awesome. But so me as an operator, it yeah. wasn't cool. Like, <laughs> I wanted right. something more. But right. now looking back at it, right. like I can actually say I went yeah. overseas to a war zone and did a true that's SF right. mission. Did your job. Like, we actually right. went out and created our own fire bases and then actually stayed in the on the fire base with the guys and train them up and let them do hits. So we were we were kind of advisors, which that's how it's supposed to work. Not many teams did that because everyone wants to do DA stuff, including myself. Like, right. I was kind of pissed at the time. Right. And but. you guys did get to do DA stuff because I got a Bob story that's re- really more. So we were, we were in Beijing, and we brought you guys on to do – we were doing a two-team hit. And you guys came in and did hits in baseball hats. Baseball hats, you know, and, and body armor and guns. And the 82nd first sergeant that lived with us was furious sure. because our team, you know, wore wore helmets, and he was furious about the unprofessional team that uh, that 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 we brought in. <laughs> Oops! That was doing hits and baseball hats in in front of their guys, and they're supposed to be guys that my guys are supposed to look up to. And here are these cowboys doing <laughs> DA hits and baseball hats. He probably made them do. He probably made his paratroopers do PT on the fob too. In the middle yeah. Of the war zone. With their fucking safety belts. <laughs> yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> so, well, is it that that was a great deployment for us too. I really enjoyed that one. We go to, we go to the unit a couple years, not not too long after that. And at this point, I can't think of anyone from the company that went to the unit before us. Hmm. And so it was a mythical thing of sorts to go to the unit. And at, at this point, um, I I wasn't tracking that you wanted to go to the unit. It was something that you know that that I had um, realized in that, in that, during that deployment in Iraq that I yeah, thought me that too. was something I wanted to, to, to go do. And um, why? I'm just wondering if it's the same reason why I went. Because I love the DA aspect. I hated the con op process. Um, I hated fighting with the Siege of Sodaf. And I wanted to see, at this point, you know, I was a first time go and everything I'd, I'd, I'd ever tried. Uh, and I want to see how far, I want to see how far I could go. Like it was at this point, like in my career, uh, that I thought uh, I went from really from like chasing Bob and like you know chasing people that that were better to me, and I kind of came in my own. And I'm not saying I was the, even the best guy in my ODA, but now I thought I was good enough to try. Right. And since I've heard different stories of why people have gone to the unit, which is, I'm sure there's tons of people that went there the same reason I did, but. Like over that first deployment, you know, that one that one gunfighter, that one tick, you know, you get shot at, you like it, you're running after people. I'm just interested why people go. So, I mean, like, the reason why I went, you get a little taste of it, and you're like, well, how, how can I have more? Oh, yeah. You know, you either, you either go to S, like, go active to the SF, or they were getting deployed a lot, but are they actually, like, you see they didn't the ticks, offer, you know, you see, the, like, the how many yeah. times they're getting in gunfights and all this stuff. So, to me, it was like... How can I get more? Right. Active you know, DSF how- didn't offer me anything more than 20th Group offered me, honestly. Yep. 
So yeah, I'm like, how, how can I get more gunfights? Well, the next fuck, the next thing was to go to the next level, right? And yeah. which I didn't know much about the unit, but I'm like, I know they're getting <laughs> right. on way more. They're going on way better That's hits. Right. Um, where I've, I've actually talked to some people, like they went to the unit out of SF because they were, they knew it was a safer place. Like to me, it was about just getting more gunfights. Other people went because they're like, okay, I, I see how how trained this team is, but if you go to the next level up, it's right. going to be right. Everyone, you're going to be fighting level. with that right that caliber. That caliber, it's going to it's going to make you safer. Yeah, kind and of. So, but you, as, as no, you I mean, that, was never, that was never the case for me. I didn't give a fuck who I was fighting with. I just <laughs> right. wanted to get in more yeah. gunfights. I mean, so. yes, you're you're fighting with a higher caliber people to your left and right, which we already talked about. But you're also hitting targets that are oh yeah, way, that are way. Action. way dicier the, you're the doing H, it more often the hbi list is way higher oh yeah than they, other they don't HBI they're not they're not usually as as willing to 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 go without a fight um and i, and I yeah, love that i, know, I love what, that aspect about it <laughs> that's that's so, what you want <laughs> so me you and we'll just say tom um uh go to selection you got selected the first time right so you get selected the first time me and tom have to go back the, the very next selection, but we both get selected, and within a uh, and within one year, and then Alex, which I which I talked about, he was picked up as a medic. Yeah. But you have in one year, you have three operators from the same company, the same National Guard SF company, and a medic go, and another guy followed us just a uh, or actually two more, Steve. I'll tell you his last name after this, and Cam, who's actually a 19th group guy who transferred to 20th group uh, on a on a deployment, and and like really. I included myself in this because we all went to selection the first time together, and it took me twice to you, you the first time. But it showed everyone else in twentieth group, hey, this is open to us. Right. Like you can, if you're good enough, yep. you can do it. Yeah, kind of paved the way to just let people know you, you can make it. I think that's a, a the, there's so many people that would go. It's just the fear of not right. passing. Oh yeah, the a lot of people of not went making it. You know, yeah, you don't, you don't guys be went. That guy. Just no one, no one, no one made it. And when they came back. It wasn't something they talked about, so we had no information going into into selection. That that I would say Rangers usually have a I feel like they'll usually have a leg up because they'll they'll go back and talk. <laughs> I brought the packing list, nothing but the packing list, and uh, on my first trip, not saying that's the reason I didn't make it, but uh, it was. But yeah, you know, you'd see the Rangers come in with a lot of yeah. intel right. and and packing the right things. It definitely made it a little bit easier for them. But to me, that's why I don't talk about selection. I think it's important not to know about selection. And you know that I hate that Eric Haney wrote that book. You know, talking so much about selection. Yeah, like it I, should I be. actually read that book before going. I and sure when, did. And when I, I sure was, did. And when I was there, I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, holy crap! He actually put out a lot of stuff. You know, I didn't know how real it would be. Yeah, there was there was stuff when I was at selection after reading that book. And well, he he gave up this or he gave up that. So you, so you, uh, you get you get to OTC before me. And now we'll we'll just you know talk about you and, and and your time in the unit was it's fair to say the selection and the Q course SF didn't do, was it challenging to you did it meet your expectations <clears throat> I'm asked that a lot I mean, well no I mean neither of them did so I know it sounds like being an asshole because yeah. I mean, people say that's the hardest thing they SF did SF selection yeah I mean both of them to me because I'm one of those guys like when we when when we were in the NQP or whatever they whatever you call it like I'm just I overtrain for everything so which I think is yeah. a good thing a lot of people will train to the standard and be like well if I have to give it a little bit more I'll be able to suck it up and do it I never wanted to be that guy I never wanted to have to suck it up so I just over train <laughs> yeah like if, if I knew I had to do a 20 miler I'd do a 40 miler if I had if I knew I had to do something a certain amount of time I would do it in half that time so I, my in my a lot of people don't do that because they think overtraining they're going to get hurt and then they're not even going to be able to right. go at all. I didn't think that at all. Like, I wanted to be like, if I had got hurt that day, I knew I could still make the standard. Sure. Yeah. You know? So, like, on my worst day, I'm making the standard. Yeah. You know? So, to me, I know I sound like a f like cocky saying right. it wasn't hard. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I probably read five books in selection in both the selections because i was always done so early yeah. and then you, know, you, you get you get time to go you know go sit over there or when you got back to the the barracks yeah if you got back early you had a lot of time right there's yeah. a lot of downtime for me so no I, I, well then it was I, hard but i actually think sf selection i say that all the time was harder i say than that all the time unit, and it was because of the land nav 
I don't, and and I mean, PT and trek and team events. You don't have any of that in, right. in, in West Virginia. It was it, like, just, just you. Just, and I liked it that way. I loved like, it. I love it that way. <laughs> you don't have right. to worry about anyone else. Well, yeah. SF selection right. was uh, like just on the land nav. You got to think where you're where you're doing on the train. Like that was all, that was all dead reckoning. That was all right. going off the compass. Can you guys have any doubt when you're doing anything and in any type of training and it's just you, and it's your plan, and the, you know, you ever do something and you're like, God, I hope I'm fucking right, or do, is it that mindset? You're like, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. I, I, I always, I, I loved it. I loved it because I knew, I knew I was just like you. I knew I was prepared for this, and I knew I was good enough for it. Um. It, both both selections it's funny I, I feel the same way even though i didn't make the first one i know what i did wrong i had one bad day in land nav and i know exactly what i did wrong and i couldn't wait to go back to selection and crush it because i knew it wasn't bigger than yeah. me and i say the same thing about sf selection because at the end of the day both selections are um unknown time unknown distance so so you have to give 100 percent at both selections so maybe you crush SF selection. You don't know because it's unknown. And maybe I just barely made CAG selection. But I have to give 100% of both. So they're both equally as hard to me because it's how much I have to put out. Mm. It's not like I can just you know meet the standard a lower standard. You don't know what the standard is. So you just give 100%. How about OTC? Did OTC meet your expectations? That Was it the first time in your career you're like, this is what I thought I was getting into? Or did it still take you know, a little bit more time Well, besides, you? and that's what I bring up in all my – when I'm giving instruction, like just from what I've what I saw there in OTC, I, I thought I was actually kind of disappointed at first. <laughs> Which, well, it takes a while for OTC to get going. So yeah, I was. It's but it was awesome to to be forced to do the basics over and over, right? right? You yep. know, to finally realize well, that that that's the only evil. thing that matters, right? right. So I, I I bring that up in all of my classes, especially for LE guys. It's not the sexy stuff that works. Like you get done with selection, being an SF guy or being at the range of battalion, hearing about what happens or you know across the hall or on the other side of the fence you never really know it is kind of a mystery right so when you make it through selection like i was i was fucking excited you might not you might not have known that because i've you know like it was easy that's how i was acting but i was excited i'm like i'm gonna go finally do stuff because i i felt like nothing was up to my standard there was always more right so i'm thinking i'm gonna go learn ninja shit like I'm gonna go learn stuff that no one knows about. Yeah. And then you get there and you're doing dry fire, <laughs> right? For like two and, weeks, and, and you're like, and what you're on the, the range with iron sights. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're doing like BRM, basic, basic rifle yeah. marksmanship. I mean, day one basic training stuff, and you're like, I'm at the best place in the world, and I'm doing this day one baby stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then you finally get to flat range, and you're doing like ready up drills. You know, I mean, not, nothing sexy. There's no, you're, you're not doing CQB right at the bat. You're not shooting from helicopters. You're not shooting missiles off of freaking dirt bikes. <laughs> 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 like I mean, it was right, disappointing. Yeah. Right. I'm like, what the fuck? But where it all caved out, like after doing that basic boring stuff, so many reps and tens of thousands of rounds, you know, when you finally start doing CQB, the shooting part just takes over. That's on autopilot. So now your brain can actually be 100% focused on the situation in front of you. So yeah. I'm making judgment calls, going to this room, this room. I'm going up this staircase, whatever. Yeah. I can be thinking about that. I don't have to worry about working the sector switch, where my finger goes on the trigger, where my hand goes on the gun. That's right. on autopilot because I just did the basic shit. Tens of thousands of times. Yeah. So it's kind of funny going to OTC. It was 100% disappointment for me. Right. Like the first couple of months, or yeah. at least the first month, I was right. like, what What the hell? Yeah. Like I want to do cool stuff, and it's not cool stuff. Until you actually get to a team, and then you you do, you do definitely do cool stuff. O- I mean, OTC ramps up, you know, eventually. It like does m- ramp mid, up. Yeah. Midway. Uh, and there's other things, like, you know, that... That takes it back to not fun stuff like uh, executive protection, you know, is, isn't uh, isn't fun. Um, some other things that, that you do that, you know, is part of a well-rounded operator that you have to learn. This isn't isn't fun. But by the end of OTC, you are, you know, flying little birds, blowing blowing doors off of, <laughs> you, you, you know, with, with charges. Cool and you're, you know, you're working in, you know, not... Not standard, uh, not the same old shoot house. So you, yeah. you, you you go out and do things, and you do low vis hits and all sorts of cool stuff. It takes a while, but by the end of it, you you are you're having fun. You're having a lot of fun. Yeah. And then how how was your experience? I always love talking. I don't get to talk to other operators very very often. How was your experience from graduating OTC? You've been doing nothing but shooting and CQB, generally speaking, you know, for, for six months, mm-hmm. and and you have this 
this or they always tell you, oh, you guys think you're good. Wait till you get to a team. What do you get to your team? So yeah. you always you know you're good. You know you're OTC good. Right. But there's this like myth about you know about squadrons that you're finally gonna experience. How was that experience for you when you finally when you got into a squadron and got to truly you know operate at a well it was it was it was a difference and it was way better than being an OTC. OTC is a lot of especially CQB. It's like point of domination right and, you know you're, you're like a it, robot it's right? graded I mean, it's, right yeah it's, it's graded by the book yeah. answer stuff yep got to the team and just like you'd said like wait until you get there or whatever and it was like the first time i did cqb because you're used to doing book answer point of domination clearing your freaking sector all that stuff yeah. first time doing cqb i was like three rooms back <laughs> you know like we went in blew the door and all yeah. of a sudden i'm in one room and right. before you know it i'm like where the fuck are they at? Right. and that's how fast right they were and, yeah. it, and they're doing it obviously not otc way but it, like that was my first right. first time going like that my experience of being on a team for the first time I mean shooting shooting but like CQB yeah. I was like holy yeah. shit these guys are fucking fast but because of that you know the yeah you know, and and you got up to that speed within you know however long it took you yeah not not that long yeah but, no it, but because of that constant grinding of the basics those guys are moving that fast and the one and two men are clearing their corners. Whether it does, whether it looks like they're doing it or not, right. I guarantee you, you put something in that corner, and they won't cut that corner off. Yep, like they'll they'll go. But that's that how corner. fast it was. It was just right. impressive to me. See, like, holy crap, man! That's what that's what happens when you get to do CQB with a team for five years straight, every and, single week. You know. And this is what I I can't do, and I can't even like really like impress on people like how what the difference is. You know, people are like ah, oh, special operators, special operations. SEALs can do CQB, Green Brace can do CQB, you know, Delta does CQB, everyone can do CQB. Nope. It is a 100% different different level, massive difference. There is no ODA regular white side SEAL team that belongs in the same house as a tier one unit. They just, it'd be dangerous for okay. them to, 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 to be in that room with us. That's why it's so cool to be there, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you even said if you step away from a significant amount of time, you're behind the Oh yeah, I, I went and did some some fun CQB with some Orange County SWAT guys and 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 uh, Mike Platinum, Mike Perry, the MMA fighter, and uh, and I felt like I was going. It's it's, it's you know it's, it's a perishable skill. Like I yep. felt like I was going slow, and I didn't like man, Brent, you still got it. We can't keep up with you. And I'm like, oh man, I was you, yeah. You felt have, like you were a turtle. Yeah, <laughs> I have no business being in the same room as a, yep. as as a, one of my yeah as a Delta Force team right yep. now. I would have to yep. I'd have to be like an OTC grad again, it is and I'd have to though. hang out in the back for a little bit and yeah. uh, and feel my way uh, back into it. But it is, yeah, well, but that's how know, it is a shooting too. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, there's shooting. some drills that I had made up when I was when I was an operator there. That I'll try doing now, I don't even come close to making my times or being as accurate I was, you know, in that drill that I came up with when I was when I was operational. Well, it definitely goes away. So at at least you still. I know there's people going to want to hear more more unit stories uh, as as, and I don't blame them. Um, but uh, I'm also because I do podcasts as well. I'm not going to make you the same old same old podcast of asking you all sorts of uh, cliche questions. That, that I know you can't talk about or want to talk about. Unit time, ama amazing time. You went through team leader, you know, hit hit all the steps, did everything you wanted to do. Yep. And, uh, you know, and you, you felt, did you, when when it was when it was time to go, and this, and everyone that, that hangs out there long enough, eventually, like, it, you, your time's up. And you're on this, you're on this rock star lifestyle to where, like, you watch the news, something happens, and you're like, Hmm, I'm on call right now. I might need to go. Good thing my bags are packed. Well, you feel important because yeah. you are important, you know. And yep. And yep. But that ride is is over at some point. Did you know it was over? And you're like, oh, all right, this, this is a good ending to my my book. So no, but I I got lucky. So it was it was 100 percent my wife telling me I had to be <laughs> done, <laughs> which right. I, I've told the story before. So sorry, Katie. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> She was there. Yeah, so I, I don't think I was. She lived. Well, it. I, you know what? It, I think mentally I knew it was like. For one, I got lucky. You, probably the same reason why you went there. You want to do more things, right? You want to be on. You want to be in the best, and you get addicted to gunfighting. You get addicted instead of coming back and be like, "Oh, great! I have eight months left." I mean, we're waiting. We can't wait until the next deployment, right? Right? Because you want to go again, and you're praying but, for a blowout but it was, in between in between those, right? But it was fun, though, back then, too. And by the time 
So I was there for when we were doing the whole Iraq and Afghanistan going back and forth, and then eventually we just did Afghanistan. So by the time we fought, went back to Afghanistan and just stayed there, things had gotten really political, not only for I mean for us as well. Yeah. So we were still doing hits, but it just wasn't as fun, right? So I'm, yeah. you're still getting it on. It was, it was still like I still want to deploy, but in the back of my mind, I was like, all right, might be getting a little bit burnout, but it just wasn't as fun anymore. So my wife, my wife one day, I mean, she said, basically you're done and we're done i mean it was simple as that and and she did it at the perfect time and yeah i don't know if she knew knew that like or, <laughs> like i might you know this is a good time to say this but yeah. she did it and because things had been dying off and and maybe i was a little bit burnt out like it was an easy answer i mean i was right. like all right i'm done like i mean i literally that morning went up to upstairs and i was like i gotta leave and leadership at that time was cool they're like they, they didn't question it yeah. Like, all right, what, how can we help you? Which I thought was awesome. You know, they weren't like, nope, you have to stay and you have to do this. They were like, all right, what can we, what can we do to help? Which they did. There was a, there was a SOCOM job, the LNO job down in SOCOM. So I was able to stay at the unit as LNO down there. That's right. But yeah, that I, I remember that Katie, actually. Yeah. And they gave Katie the, the break that she needed. And that was kind of funny, though. I figured I'm going to end at the unit. Right. So I thought, two-year break? Like, we were renting our house out up there. Okay. <laughs> it was like two or three years. And time was coming done with the LNO job, and I was like, I went home one day. I was like, Hey, we we probably need to let the renters know mm. we're coming back, because <laughs> I had all intentions of going back, you know, yeah. getting back. Because um, I mean, they were slotted. Did you be a I, mean, I was already, major? I was already wanna... slotted, yeah. Because when I left, I was actually the acting troop sergeant major before okay. even going to uh, be a selection okay. guy. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm want to go back. I'm gonna yeah. finish off my as a troop sergeant major. Well, I told her. Told her like we should probably tell the renters to get out, and she was like, "Excuse me, she's back in Florida now." <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this is her yeah. home, so that's right. And and Bob is so leaving all the up, time. We ended up staying, yeah. and, and it actually was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Yeah. Like I would have, like you just you know how the guys are. They're gonna be loyal dogs. They're never no no one's gonna say I quit, or no one's gonna leave just because they want to leave. I was kind of forced to, so it was an easy way out for me. I'm like, it's I'm not leaving. That was that right. was heard saying that, right? Right. So, couldn't have happened at a better time. Right. And it was the absolutely the best thing ever happened to me, because otherwise I would just I would have just stayed there and went until I was until I retired, you know, until I retired. So that's what that's what pushed me out was that. But that, uh, I would never look back and be like, oh yeah, I wish I would have had another couple. Uh, of but years. you like, did your team time. You know, yeah. what I mean, you did your team time. Like there's in a weird way, there's, Which there's is no the, more that's, fun that to be is, had after that. Exactly. You know. Yep. What what did you do after we talked about it a little bit? But what did you do either immediately? Or how long did it take you to yeah. to, to start your? So your I got company? lucky again now being able because I think that's what the hard part with retirement, which which anyone in the service is going to happen. But like us, we we live at five hundred miles an hour, like I would say daily. Even even during training, we're five hundred miles an hour. So a lot of guys when they retire, they go from five hundred miles an hour to a screeching halt zero. They, they have no purpose, and and, right. and just like you yep. said, they're not important anymore, right? Yeah. That's hard. For, that's that's a yeah. hard transition to have that abrupt stop. Yeah. I got lucky because I went down to SOCOM. I'm sitting at a desk, so those first six months were still hard, but I was still part of the unit. I right. could still go back at the brag whenever I wanted to, and shoot, and you know, like on weekends or or take a trip up there, whatever. I, I was still considered operational, somewhat, you know. So it was. That transition wasn't from 500 miles. Uh, it was like down to 250. Yes, yeah. exactly. I was yeah. still doing stuff, and I'm still right. part of the unit. That's right. You're still so related. So two years, once that wears off on you, it's very easy to get out at zero miles an hour. Like you're yeah. used. To, it's it's right. just that uh, not abrupt stop. So for me, transition was very easy. For some people, it's very hard. Yeah. Like, uh, that is very hard to steer that whole time and then just stop. And now you're a civilian. Yeah. You have no purpose and no one, yeah, no one cares. I mean, no one cares who the hell you were that's right. or what you did. When yeah. your job's your identity too, that's hard. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. is. But now you don't have that anymore. So um, I get it for a lot of people. I got lucky. I, it was a slow, gradual yeah. retirement. Yeah. So you get so you finally retire. You yep. do a retirement ceremony there there in Sarah and, and SOCOM? Nope. I just got got the hell out. No retirement, nothing. That's what I did. I, I don't know why, I, why why would I need why would I need one? I went to the I, I left the building. I went to the Sly Fox uh, in Southern Pines by myself, <laughs> ordered a beer, and just sat there and drank it slow. I don't even know what I was thinking about. And then and then and then I went home. That that was that was my day of retirement. Mm -hmm. That's something I wish I 
would have would not have done. Really? You, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. And I think you'll understand this. And I think well, at the end of the day, it was selfish of me to do that. And I, and I gave the same answer to all my friends and, and family. Hey, no one threw a party for me when I got here. No one's throwing a party for me when I leave. Go to work. Um, but I don't, it wasn't just for me. You know, it, it was for it was for my wife uh, right. as well. You know, and, and my kids and, you know, a, a time for them to, to celebrate the, the, the end of it. And I think as much as I didn't intend for that to be, I think that's what ended up happening. Well, I wanted to say, so, I mean, squadrons do everything differently. We, you know, we, we don't follow any squadron. I, I want to say when I was leaving or before I even left, it was different for me because I had, I had transitioned from the unit to SOCOM for retirement. Okay. But I think our like our squadron was forcing people to actually have a retirement <laughs> because they knew no it's, one would do it, and right. they knew it was for right. the family. Yeah, yeah, which I understood that. Like I get it. Yeah. It's, hey, it's for right your wife who's been with you for that's you know, right twelve deployments. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. I would say they're they're more badass than we are for sure. I mean, I'm get, I'm going overseas to do what I want to do, and I love to do it. <laughs> I'm hanging out with the boys. I'm doing. I'm the wives are home. Right, mowing the yard, taking care of the kids, feeding the dogs, right. cleaning the house, waiting for while a phone we're call. literally yeah. in Disney World. Yeah, you know, and then and they're waiting for the call. I mean, how stressful is that? So yeah, I, hats off whenever anyone ever says, "Oh, thanks for your service." I'm like, don't thank me, <laughs> thank my wife, hundred yeah. percent. She, she she enabled it. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? What'd you do after the military? What was what was your your first gig, or did you or yeah, uh, as so you I were kinda, transitioning, kinda you, you're already right figuring that right out. Right into um, at. Um, at SOCOM because it was a desk job. It was a Monday through Friday job, weekends off. I started kind of just by chance. We had like this, this open range day out at um, out of McDill, and the cops were allowed to come shoot at a range. And I linked up with some cops one day, and I just saw how they were like how they were training and how and I don't want to be an asshole, but how bad they were at shooting, right? So I was like, these guys could use some help, right? So yeah. I started like training them up. Kind of more from there to hey, you, you kind of like you're doing for free, you know, helping these guys out. Well, help some out, and they're like, man, you. I mean, this is a really good curriculum. Like you could, yeah. you should start like you monetize this. You, you should yeah. start <laughs> doing this as a not right. as a living, but you should yeah. start giving classes. I never even thought about it. I don't. Yeah. I'm not an instructor. Like I never was. I was like, oh, yeah, well, why not? I'll I'll do it to help people out. And it kind of started out. I have a thing called Operation Blue that you were talking about, like free training to cops. So I started doing that, yeah. and I started incorporating that into actually paid classes. That morphed into giving classes to civilians, paid, and then it just it just kind of worked. To eventually, for the last eight years, I've been all over the country giving classes. So, so open enrollment classes, working for agencies, uh, doing. Most of my most of my classes are LE classes, mm -hmm. but it's all over the country, so I'm like a s traveling salesman. It's not like big contract stuff. Yeah. It's just 10 to 15, 20 people, one class, you know. And then that morphed into buying buying property and then having a range. So yeah, you bought a range, or you bought property. Bought property and have have a range, have, have a range I, on there. I know that's one of the struggles for a lot of companies is the you know not having their own range. Mm -hmm. They have to go rent out ranges to yeah. ho host their classes. Yep. Oh, so you can do an open enrollment well, that's, class. Well, that's actually kind of what go, did it, too. Go out into your and, into I, your front yard, so to speak, and, yes. and you're at work. And I, that was a little bit, but I, th I think what really did it is, like, my first five or six years, I'm going all over the country. Yeah. Just like you said, going to ranges while right. I'm paying them right. for me to give a class there. So I'm paying sometimes 500 bucks a day to rent a bay out. So it's $1,000 $1, in one weekend. Yeah. And they're not lifting a finger. Yeah. Like, they're literally just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving them a thousand bucks. All they had to do is let the you know the baby free for two days. So I'm thinking, well, that's a pretty good business plan, right? Like yeah. if you can rent these bays out yeah. and get a thousand dollars for two days, that's pretty smart, right? And, and I'd seen like how the unit ranges are. You know, like that's a right. pretty awesome oh, yeah. facility. Oh yeah. But then I also been to public ranges and private ranges. I was like, man, this could very, really, this could really be a good facility, but they just didn't know how to run it. So I was like, I, I could, I could definitely do this better. And so, it seems like no one invests back into their all, all the ranges and shoot houses are like they just, still stuck in the eighties, nineties. They just go to shit. Yeah. yeah. So that was another reason I was like, I can, I can actually build a facility that would be badass, right? Because right? I'm taking unit experience and I'm taking all the other ranges that I've seen. That's right. Throughout the last six or seven yep. years, that I can not do this mistake or not have this exactly. mistake or this yep. person wasn't doing this. So that's what my range is. And I, our ranges, I mean, it's set up. Exactly. If I was going to be a member at a range, that's how I'd want it to be, and that's how I set it up. Yeah. So, Do you have members by chance at your range as well? Yeah, you, it's, it's a membership-only range. Oh, nice. 
we do rent the bays out for industry people if they right. want to come test guns right. and stuff or i rent uh, right. bays out for other instructors and we hold we hold events out there but yeah. the membership it is, thing it is great. truly a membership because you have range. residual income of just of, of guys that just yeah go go and go and shoot yep so how how'd, how'd you cool. come up with the name uh uh gambit resolutions how'd you come up with that name because at <laughs> People, yeah, until you start a business. So it might not work sense. It and, might not and, make sense. And, but. and same with you. Until you start a business, people just, they take for granted these things. Yeah. And, that, and now when it's yours yeah. and you have to name it, you're like, oh, oh what am hard, I going right? to name this? Yeah. So almost everyone was always solutions. Something solutions. Okay. So I don't well, want to yeah, be a solutions yeah. guy. <laughs> solutions guy. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this was weeks. This is he was talking about. It's hard to pick a name. Uh, so the gamut was like I'm thinking, all right, I'm, I teach, I can teach anything when it comes to firearms. It can just be normal shooting. I can do vehicle stuff. I can do CQB. I mean, I, what we did at the unit, you're yeah. pretty much the best at everything, right? Right, everything tactically related. So everything tactically related. So I'm like, yeah. well, that's everything, right? What's fully encompassing? Like, yeah. what's a word that means fully encompassing? Gamut, yeah. right? Gamut. Yeah. The yeah. definition is all encompassing. Yeah. So that was that's where i got that and then the resolutions i didn't want it to be solutions resolutions <laughs> dic uh, dictionary answer of resolutions it's the decision to not or to do or not do something that's like that's a book answer for resolutions so when it comes to gun fighting you got to think right i mean that's you have to make the decision am i gonna am i gonna do something am i, yeah. am I not gonna do something so I, I love that's, those. That's where it went from gamut resolutions. It's it's all encompassing, yeah. and it's the decision to do or not do something. Hmm. I love those answers, and and I love getting to actually sit here and, and you know without this, sit in the sit, pick your brain and and uh, and hear and hear your story in a, in a more detailed way than we just don't, don't do as as, as friends, <laughs> right. just you know randomly catching up. So you know you can you can play and and rightfully so possibly at times the 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 big dumb animal where you just out you know you just out trained and out you know you, you rely on your strength to get you by but you're also you know if people are picking up on this he's also reading books when he's when he's done early like the the, the answer you have about your uh your company like the dictionary answer like a meaning and, behind right the, so at the end of the day like an, an, shit out of your an ass. operator an operator really can't just outlift his you know uh, uh has his way through you know through problems you know like people underestimate the quality i shouldn't say they underestimate maybe they just don't fully uh understand or expect the type of man it takes you know, to be at the unit and that's not just guys that are in great physical shape but some of the smartest dudes and it may not be like iq smart so to speak but just problem solvers street smarts uh, on, you know, and, and as well as you know, intellectually smart. Like, the, you cannot be dumb and be at the unit. Yeah. You cannot. Yeah, it wasn't all studs. Yeah, like that was impressive. I mean, I, it, right, a guy. Who, oh, it goes back to saying done. it's it's not it's not the best guy for the job. It's the right guy for the job. Yep. And I've talked before. Like it took me a couple of years to figure out what that really meant. Because wouldn't the best guy for the job be the right guy for the job? But some of the biggest studs that you know came through the selection, you know, got kicked out of the board. And like, man, why didn't that mm -hmm. guy make it? You know, that's he just he wasn't the right guy. Yep. How'd you get uh, Range Works? How'd you get caught up into that? What the Range facility? Yeah, that's what I was just talking about. It was, it was, it was, I'm sorry. Is Range, range that, Works is, yeah, is the name the range of, of, facility, of your range? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And you run so, and you run your company out of out of Range Works. Yeah, well, kind well of. As, I, as do, well go, I do. I do. I give. Out. I do give classes there, but it's very little actually. But the majority of my classes are out of state, so it's stupid on my part right i'm, I'm traveling mm -hmm. all over the place and i have my own range and i do that on purpose so um because for one you can't expect everyone to come to you right I mean, that's expensive they're paying not only for the class now right. they're paying for travel yeah. now right. they're paying for hotel now they're paying for yeah. food so i you have to go to them yeah. to make it work on it's not just one guy on the way that i'm for doing travel. stuff one guy's paying for a hotel rather than 20. right yeah. so uh and then the whole really it's just out of uh me giving classes at my range, it's it's the heat in Florida. Gosh, a lot of people can't take it. A lot, <laughs> well, of and I don't want to either. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I do very little. I do I do class yeah. in the winter, but summer <laughs> months I don't do any class at my range unless it's like a hosted class that like cops are saying we yeah. want a class in July. Yeah, I said I'm going to do it. Right, but I I don't do I don't do like <laughs> open enrollment classes right. in the, the summer. The price might be a little higher. <laughs> 
try to deter him from it, but if they'll pay that almost, much, we'll do it in July. It's, crazy. it's a July it's price. Almost, it's we, almost all the LE class I do in Florida are always either June, July, or August, <laughs> which you, is just insane. You going to SHOT Show by chance? No. Okay. No. Yes. Uh, I'll do, what's what's next for you? What's, what's you know, as... I'll, do you feel like, you know, as a company, you, know, not, you, you have the range, you have your yeah. your, your, your book of sorts of, of customers. Are you, are you, are you set? <laughs> so I'm dwindling. Or? So 2024 is actually my last last year doing open enrollment classes. So that's putting up class on my website. I'm, I am going to those classes. Like, they're already set yeah. in stone. What's your website? It's the last uh, gamut resolutions, yeah, dot com is where you can find all my classes on the website. Um, or you can just follow me at on social media, Instagram or Facebook, which I don't even know what my handle is. <laughs> Just Google Bob Kelly. I'll, 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 up. I'll put it up there. <laughs> put it up there for sure. Um, yeah, 2024, ramping it down. I'll always do LE classes, agency classes, military classes if they if they want me to come to them or they don't come to me. But open enrollment, I'm done after this year. So instead of ramping up, I'm actually ramping down um, and just spending it'll be more time at home and more time at the range. There's so much. There's so much shit to do at the range. Does that does a uh, military hire you for anything? As yeah, far as like I've done. I've done multiple SF SF teams on the yeah. shooting. I'm like I'm real big on. Everyone wants to do CQB. Yeah, all, all the LE guys yeah. want to do CQB. All the SWAT guys want to do CQB. Military guys want to do CQB because I mean I would say we are the best at CQB, hands down. But Rob no O'Neill no would beg to differ. <laughs> I'm just letting you know let's, that. Let's have him on. Let's have him on. <laughs> he lets Brent know I've, every day. I've heard I've heard some things that they do CQB wise that I'm like, how how can you as a just a human with common sense think that this is right? Remind anyhow, me, I'm gonna talk about done, that later. I'll tell you a story about one of their OTC classes. I don't want to talk about that, but remind me about that. But anyhow, I try I try to talk I try to talk everyone out, uh, like team wise, out of doing a CQB class and just start with a shooting class. Yeah. Just to show them like I know you're not ready. Like oh. They they think that they're ready to do CQB, which I get that they have to know how to do it. Right. Yeah, that's part of your job description. But I always try to talk to people, and, and CQB is awesome. It's sexy. But I always try to do it. Like going back, let me show you the basic boring stuff for two days. And then if you want to do a vehicle class or a CQB right. class, we'll do it. And I'll, the smart ones, actually, when they when they have me come back, they're like, we want to do the basic stuff again. I'm like, yeah. all right, you guys get it. And I, I mean, to me, like I – I just got I just got done doing Sarasota SWAT, which those guys were equivalent to us C- CQB. Shut your mouth! Yeah, I am not kidding. I'm go, I had I'm two other go. I had two other operators help me on that class. Yeah, and they were like, "We've never seen anyone as good as you guys." And this That's was awesome. LE guys, right? But I like I was I was I was I do CQB different. I do a cl- it's shooting and CQB. If you're if you're hiring me to do a CQB class, you're getting shooting out of it. So we flip flop, but the third day I was actually with those guys and I'm watching them flow. So their their shots aren't like ours are. Right. I mean, ours would be like this, you know, moving and shooting. Their shots weren't there. They need more work on shooting wise, but right. flow wise, yeah, that's good to hear. I was like, holy, <laughs> you guys are doing the right yeah. thing. Whatever you I, know, I'll say this though, they were wor- switched on from working with them. They're always good guys. They're always good guys. They, for the most part, they they kind of know that that they need help and that they're not the best and they know Those that are the that, smart ones and they know that they're probably op- operationally too much and don't train enough uh and so you, and you and they're good guys man that's that's what really made my made me want to help out those guys and give training for free and do the first responders company and give back to them cuz they're good dudes they're doing a, an amazing job day in and day out they just don't have the time and resources yeah, sometimes absolutely. to get where they need to be you nailed it when you just start when you started your company and you started going on podcasts and you started being a little bit more vocal when you retired, you said and it, it hit with everybody. Cause I remember the team would always talk about it when you weren't there is that, you know, when your family needs help, the Delta force isn't coming, it, you know, it's first responders that are coming. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, yeah. they're, they're essentially when it comes down to a barricaded person in a hostage situation, and you're going to have to train that team to the best that they can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, Absolutely. They're doing that job and no one likes them. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just a it's a right. shitty job right yeah. now where they used to have respect and now no one respects them. And now they're, they're the ones responding and helping out. Right. And they're going to someone that doesn't even right. freaking and, like them. And, but they want their help. That's right. Yeah. They, I mean, when they On their worst day, they want them. Yeah. Um, exactly. And I know what you mean by that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll cap out saying this. If you look on social media and you watch the news, the perception is no one likes them. Uh, but there's a lot more people that you're do right appreciate that. them. You, you are, them, you are right not the vocal that. ones. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. And I hope, 
it still happens that they still get their coffee pot for them and they still sit down in uniform and don't pay for a meal most times because uh, there is a lot of people in this country that do absolutely still hold them in, in, in high regard. Do you have a do you have a shoot house at uh, at Range Works? No. Where do you do where do you see CQB training at? Uh, if I, if at, I'm doing at, it for there. LE, yeah, either if they have a facility, we do it on property on their yeah. property, or we just go out to abandoned houses or buildings. Any any plans of possibly building a shoot house out there? Ask that for selfish reasons. <laughs> I mean, if you got if you got two million dollars, <laughs> I'm all ears, baby. <laughs> uh, it's tough though. Honestly, I only only got half that. So so I do <laughs> have I do actually have a spot that I kind of designated. Like I have an area that I could put one up, but no, I'm not, yeah. honestly, on the whole, because we are a membership, like right. only range, pretty much. It's you can't put a shoot house out there, and then, like I mean, you could put locks on everything. Oh, I mean, right. members are gonna want you. Right. Gonna, oh, I can do CQB. I want to do oh, CQB. Well, I can't yeah. trust everyone to yeah. do the right thing. Know. We'll talk. Maybe a sim so, shoot house. I will. We'll figure <laughs> it out. would be yeah. sims. Would, yeah, yeah. But still, like even that, it's, it's just <laughs> I do have staff out there, but. It's kind of it's a cool range. Like w once you're a member out there, you get a key fob. You got 24/7 access out there. So as a shooter, it's like you have to go through my orientation before you become a member. Right. But you're your own RSO. So once you're a member yeah. out there, you have 24/7 access. You can go to the range anytime yeah, you, you want. You got a little mini range 19 out there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah everything's provided for you too. Like all the steels, uh, stick stands, backers, spray glue, staples, staple guns, everything's out there. Where so and where members is Members don't need to bring anything except for their guns and ammo. Yeah, let them know where 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 Range Works. So uh Range so Range Range Works is in Fort Meade, Florida. So I think from here it's about an hour and 20 minutes. So most of our most of our members are either from Orlando, Tampa or Sarasota, but Lakeland's a big one too. Okay. It's worth it. Like most, uh, shit, we, I got members that are from uh, the Panhandle. I got members that, are, that live in Miami. You just can't find a range that, for one, everything's provided, and it's open 24-7. Yeah. Mm. Like that's just a cool. Go back to like the CQB, though. A lot of times, like you're your own RSO, so you get through the gate. Yeah. A lot of times, there's not staff out there. There's, yeah. You know, there's. I, yeah. I love that part <laughs> of it, though. Yeah. And, I'm, and your members love it, It's too, a good so. old boy. or It's right. a big boy system, so yeah. to have... Two cool stuff out there. Well, <laughs> we got we got tens of thousands of listeners, so I, I hope to get you a, a few more members uh, yeah. for, for for your time coming over here. Yeah, it's Bob, great. I I can't thank you enough for for for. I know it'd, be, it'd have been too easy to call in, you know this this uh, this interview like like you do with a lot of podcasts. Yeah, but well, you made time for us. You made the drive over here to do this in person, uh, and I I can't thank you enough for doing that. And again, I can't thank you enough for being the standard that I got to look up to because uh, I truly don't believe I'd uh, you know been the same Green Beret when, you know, without, uh, without being an NQP with you. And I don't know if I'd have made it through, you know, uh, West Virginia. Like, I'm not going to let him beat me. That's right. Yeah. At that <laughs> point, you know, I didn't look as you, uh, you know, as you know, the, the guy way ahead of me, but you know, the, the guy that I, yeah. And that, and why we were both training up and Hey, what, what are you doing? Like, what, what are your times? You know? Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I could meet those times if, I, I wasn't there, but they they weren't so far away from me anymore that I, you know that they were unobtainable. Right. It let me know you're not there yet, Brent. Train harder, and I and I ended up you know meeting those standards that you set, and I never got a chance to to say thank you for what you did for my career that you didn't even know you did just you're, by you're setting welcome the standard. for making you smoke yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob, last last question. Uh, we, we ask it to, to every to everyone and it's usually the first the first one you come up with is the right answer and man I bet you got a bunch to pull from do you have a funny story uh, from your career it could be a ranger story a green beret story a unit story a, a, a training story uh, could be a dive school story of having to pull your roommate through dive well, school well, and tell him not to quit that's every one of those day things. there's so many stories uh, do you have a funny story it's not. It's it's not really a funny story. I'd say the funny things that happen on target, like at the yeah. unit, and I mean at it, and I'm sure it happened uh, that one deployment I did with SF. Like just like like going to target. It's not really a story. Just things that happen that a lot of people don't realize. I mean, we're all studs, right? Like we're all not infallible landing, studs. Not landing on the X, you landing on the right. Y. You're you're hauling ass across the desert under nods. Right. You know, target after target. And we're not all perfect, you know. Yeah, it's not easy running full on with full kit, <laughs> ladders and guns in your hands, and you're on nods, right? And you're in a brownout. Yeah, like just things like it, and and it and it shows. Uh, 
it's kind of why I like to bring this one up. Like how everyone wants to be on target. Like I mean, it's, right. it's pretty exhilarating to right. be around a whole troop load of guys. And everyone they, wants to be they, first. They all want to be first, right. so everyone wants to be first, right? So like running off off the bird, a lot of times you can't even see your compass in front of you. Like brownout's so bad. Like you literally can't look down and see where you're going. But you have a general direction. Well, some people get off the left side. Some people get off the right side of the bird. The guys on the right side of the bird are behind the power curve, right? Right. But everyone wants to be first because if you're first, you get to shoot first. That's right. If, That's if right. there's contact. So it's a, it's a big race, which is funny as hell. And every, everyone's going as fast as they can. Well, yeah, it's usually the young guys are... You get older, you get a little fatter, a little out of shape. <laughs> Those guys are up ahead, and you'll see him. Like, Son of a bitch, like he's way up there. You're trying to catch him. Yeah. And you're running, and all of a sudden you, you'll see him fall. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. And then you're, like, you're running by him, and no one's helping each other. Right. Like, I mean, you're running over him, going, "Yeah, sucker!" You know, like you fell. You know, and then like ten steps right. later, you fall. And you're like, Son of a bitch. <laughs> you know? But it's like that's night. Yeah. You know, like yeah. just running to target. Oh man, I, you're right, man. I'd love to anyone just have that experience. Put a. Put it's a, so fun. A, to, everyone's everyone's rushing to go. There's no. It doesn't need to be on the even team ground. Doesn't farmlands. Dude, you're falling just, all the time. Time. Yeah, <laughs> we had we had this guy. Another kind of a funny story, real quick. Uh, running a target, going across. It wasn't it wasn't like rice paddies, but it was like the farm land, the farm fields get wet and they're muddy. Well, this guy uh, had a had a fake leg. He was I think he was the first operator to ever be back allowed operational. But it's funny, Not like him. going across going across the field, you know, and he's got this he's got a freaking prosthetic leg. He's up he's up ahead. He's also. He's, in fairness, he's also about 30, 40 pounds lighter because he doesn't have a leg. So, you know, I don't like to <laughs> but give, he those, can guys, run, right? I don't so give those guys too much credit. They have an he, advantage. Yeah, they got it. They're, yeah. ro- they're ro- robotic now. <laughs> anyhow, he's running across and all of a sudden gets it's thick mud. Yeah. Well, he takes one step, takes another step, leg pops out. <laughs> so his leg's stuck in the mud. Well, he falls over because now he's got one leg, right? Yeah. And you'd think at least one person's going to, like, stop and help him. No, everyone's running by him. He's like, ah, someone grab my leg. And I'm like, fuck you, <laughs> There's a story I was looking for. We got it. Like it's just funny. Like yeah. no one helped them. Nope. Like you'd think someone was stopping. He's like, "Well, no, hell no. We're going to yeah. Target. We got to put uh, breach up." You know. Uh, I love but that. I love that he even asked. It, it, no, I mean it was yeah. like everyone's like, oh, right, yeah. You know, like yeah. running by him, and everyone's like, "You just left the guy there." It's like you have. He's fine. You have you have support and headquarters come <laughs> behind. Right. That's like, their job. S- someone's right. gonna help. That's him. a support job. He'll get your leg. <laughs> no one stopped. It was just funny as shit. His legs stuck in the mud. Uh. <laughs>